Before we unlock the future, we must find the keys to the past. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Join me and open the door to ancient mysteries beginning now. Australia's Aborigines. They are the oldest continuous culture on Earth. Enshrined in oral traditions stretching back perhaps 100,000 years are secrets which are memorized by initiates but strictly forbidden to any outsiders. Their ancient chants and rituals may bring fertility to the land, health to the sick, or death to their enemies. Can their doctors perform surgery without entering the body and kill merely by suggestion? These remarkable people have created enduring works of art which dazzle the senses and intrigue the mind. They literally worship the land and the mysterious ancestral beings they believe created it. From their mythic beginnings as wandering tribes of hunter-gatherers until this very day, their ancient culture has given them the knowledge to survive in a hostile environment and the wisdom to preserve it. They are the custodians of the dream time, an astonishing philosophy which encompasses the primordial past, the present, and the distant future. But how do Aborigines become possessed by their ancestral spirits? How has the dream time survived for over 60,000 years? Discover the answers to these and other intriguing mysteries as we explore the world of the Aborigines of Australia. Australia. The indigenous people who live here celebrate, cherish, and obey ancient traditions which may represent the oldest continuous line of human wisdom on earth. It is called the dream time, a body of stories which describe the creation of the world. In scenes which might have been recorded on the first page of the Book of Time, the dream time culture still thrives, linking the past, the present, and the future. The dream time secrets, passed from generation to generation in sacred stories, art, song, and dance, give the Aborigines knowledge of a spirit world, one which to the uninitiated is invisible. It is magical, and it is alive with the supernatural. The dream time is an Aboriginal English word that describes a worldview, a philosophy, a way of life, as well as a religion. The most ancient eras of the dream time describe the creation of the world, then the creation of all the different creatures that populate the world and finally the creation of people and there are all sorts of ancestral beings heroes that traveled across the landscape shaping transforming it and creating all of the different creatures that now inhabit it according to ancient aboriginal belief at the dawn of time supernatural beings arose from the mud of a lifeless earth some took human form, others traveled in the form of kangaroos, lizards, snakes, 
or birds. They journeyed over the shapeless earth, creating the landscape as they went, and giving birth to the first aboriginal people. As they created the land, in their wake the ancestral beings created a network of sacred pathways which stretch hundreds of miles across Australia. People talk about the pathways that the dreamings took and certain places in the countryside are still believed to be potent or latent with the potent force of these particular beings that went into the land at certain spots. So for people today, these concepts are still very much alive and very much the focus for important rituals. Today, the Aborigines live primarily in the north, central and western regions of Australia. The Outback, an incredibly varied landscape covering over two-thirds of the continent. In the north, during the monsoon season, Tropical rainforests are instantly transformed into treacherous floodplains. In the central and western deserts, where there are no continuous water supplies, temperatures can reach over 100 degrees each day and drop below freezing each night. At first glance, the outback may seem to be one of the most desolate and harsh regions of the world. How have these remarkable people managed to survive in such severe and unforgiving lands, in areas which even today are considered to be uninhabitable? The answer lies in the ancient wisdom contained within the dream time stories. The elders of each tribe are the keepers of this knowledge. Through a lifetime of intense, secret, and gradual initiations, they have come to understand the mysteries of survival. It is their responsibility to pass this timeless wisdom to their children. It's basically how you're going to survive in the buddy, in the bush area. Knowledge about what you can use, what's edible, what's not edible, and you know, what sort of trees we use or plants we use for medicinal uses. And all that knowledge is passed on from your seniors. We used to walk around in small family bands and take the food as we needed it. And the elders probably wouldn't know exactly where we were going, but as kids, you just trusted your elders. But while you're going, they're teaching you everything that you need to know to survive. The land offers so much. It's food, it's water, gives us shelter, gives us the wood that we need to make tools. So you, when you learn those skills and you learn about how country changes, you learn how to look after it as well. And learning those skills is through these ancestral stories. From childhood, the Aborigines are taught the skills needed to obtain food almost anywhere. Surprisingly, in this land which outsiders would consider intolerable, the Aborigines see a garden of delights. Yet if their surroundings are harsh, why haven't the Aborigines tried to change them? Over the course of hundreds of generations, why haven't they cultivated the land, or built homes, churches, or cities? Because the very land they walk upon was created by their ancestral spirits, the Aborigines believe that it cannot and must not be changed. They regard nature itself as holy. It is their cathedral. It's an amazing feeling of, you know, just that goodness of being part of it. You know you're part of that, you know that is part of you. You know that this, this is you. And this is 
you. That is you. That rock face there, that cliff face. The whole of the tree is you. This grass is you, and every animal, insect, and reptile is you. Throughout the continent, inscribed in the rock walls of sacred caves, are powerful images from the dream time. The most powerful ancestral being is called the Great Rainbow Serpent. Even today, the Aborigines glorify her as the mother of all creation. Could she be the world's oldest continuously worshipped deity? To anthropologists, the origin of the first Australians is still shrouded in mystery. But for the Aborigines, there is little doubt. They believe the world and everything in it was created by the great rainbow serpent. Let me tell you a story. In the earliest days, when time began, spirit beings lived. Chief among these was the great rainbow serpent, the mother who created the world, and who even today causes the plants and animals to multiply, and women to bear children. In the dream time, the rainbow serpent took a husband, and from their union came the first people. Rainbow serpent myth. Gunwingu tribe. They say we were always here. Now, whether they're referring in a spiritual sense, which they could be, that would be right. Because anthropologists have said we've come from somewhere else. And that may be so too. I think our people always say we were always here. Many researchers believe the Aborigines may have originally come to Australia from Southeast Asia. Yet this still remains a mystery, for scientists have been unable to single out a group of Asian people that would qualify as an originating race. One way of looking at this system of uh, the dreaming and the whole idea of ancestral beings is to consider that at some point in time, perhaps 40,000, perhaps 60,000, perhaps 100,000 years ago, the first human beings arrived in Australia. In a sense, they were the first ancestral beings. Their travels, their initial journeys described the landscape for humans for the very first time. In that sense, they created the landscape for subsequent human use. Details of the dream time story could be literally true. The legends tell of extraordinary creatures who first inhabited this land. Many of them taking the appearance of gigantic kangaroos, enormous crocodiles, and lizards. Once dismissed as fantasy, paleontologists have actually discovered huge fossils of these very same creatures. Fossils which have been dated to 50,000 years ago. How long had people lived here? Until the 1970s, scientists believed the Aborigines had inhabited Australia for only 10,000 years. Then, in 1974, at Lake Mungo, archaeologists uncovered ancient skulls and rudimentary tools which placed the first Australians here at least 40,000 years earlier. This proved people had lived here at the very same time as the amazing animals established by the fossil record. 
the dream time myths may be a continuous oral description of very real creatures. If the dream time is one way in which the past communicates with the present, there are also others. Placed here over 30,000 years ago, these symbols deliberately left by humans are the most ancient messages on our planet. Why did they do this? What need forced these early humans to make their presence known? Was it a compulsion to express themselves? Or perhaps an enigmatic part of their religion? These simple forms were followed by accomplished paintings of sacred animals and supernatural ancestor spirits, the gods of the Aborigines. The most sacred deity found here is the great rainbow serpent. It may be the oldest religious emblem in the world. For perhaps 60,000 years, sacred stories have been told of the great rainbow serpent. To this day, it embodies a mysterious source of power. It's a very widespread belief actually um, in a lot of cultures, particularly throughout the north. And it's associated with the monsoon season, with fertility. And it's a bit of an ambiguous being because it is related to the storms, the destruction of the wet, but also the fertility and the growth. Essentially what we found was that the core elements of the rainbow serpent oral history that's present today can be traced back to the beginning when they were first made. With the rainbow serpent here we have the first major deity that continues to be very important today. If the Aborigines did indeed migrate from Asia, might they have brought the concept of the rainbow serpent with them? If so, their beliefs may not only represent the world's oldest continuous religion, but perhaps the first, one from which all others sprang. Yet unlike other religions, the Aborigines did not build churches, mosques, or temples. Their sacred songs were never written down, but painstakingly memorized by generation after generation, passed down through rituals of song and dance. As they perform these stories today, a mysterious transformation sometimes occurs. You learn an ancestral story, you then learn about how to sing it, but you also learn how to dance it as well. And when you do that, when you graduate into learning those steps, you're acting out that ancestor. And so it becomes very much a part of you. As with all dance, we find that we enter some sort of an altered state or a different form of being perception. And some individuals who are so involved with the particular aspects of the ceremony are said to take on some of the features of the ancestral beings that they are dancing to or relating to in the ceremonies. Could this enigmatic connection to their timeless spiritual ancestors give the Aborigines a form of paranormal knowledge denied to those of us brought up in cities? As we regard these ancient ceremonies, are we in fact looking at what religion was like for all of us when people first walked the earth? I'm 
The magic of the dream time, though ancient, is not rigid or unchanging. For the Aborigines, the ancient ancestral spirits are still very much alive, communicating with believers even as they sleep. Sometimes new painting designs, new songs, or elements of ceremonies first come to an individual in a dream. People are very much aware of their dreams and they comment on the significance. Dreams are considered to be a normal part of experience that we shouldn't dismiss. Dreams may also bring flashes of psychic knowledge. Can tapping into the subconscious give Aborigines the power of mental telepathy? We go to sleep at the night, we can dream something what's happening over there. Or maybe somebody must have got hurt, because we can dream that over this end. The ability to look into the future and assess was a gift that was given to some of our people. They could tell us what was happening in the future. I have been with Aboriginal people who have said something that they could not have known otherwise, and, and later we found that it actually had occurred. So I believe that there is a, a form of communication that in contemporary Western society we don't pay enough attention to, and certainly we don't understand. But in more traditional Aboriginal societies, people uh, say that it's a part of normal life. The Aborigines are keen observers of nature. What some people may consider mere superstition, the Aborigines see as messages from the spirit world. You might be walking through the bush and all of a sudden a tree falls out of nowhere and you go and examine it, that tree's perfectly healthy, there's no termites in it. That's a sign, you know, something's happened. Where that tree may be pointing is where that bad luck's happened. And as you travel then, you move on, you come closer to that area, then that's when you hear the news. To the Aborigines, the spirit world is forever linked to the physical world of human beings. Our life cycle is not seen as merely a period stretching from birth to death, but as an eternal and repetitive one, in which every living thing will be reincarnated. In the dream time, a great waterfall flowed from the mountains. In a cave nearby lived Mutjinga, a woman of power, in those days, all the things in the world had both a physical form, which could be seen, and a spirit form, which was invisible. When living things died, their spirits flew to the secret cave of Mutjinga, where they remained until it was time to be born again. Murumbata myth, Port Keats. In the dream time, the ancient ancestor spirits not only created the land as they traveled, they also deposited the unborn spirits of future aboriginal children along the way. Near a sacred cave or water hole, these spirit children have waited to be reincarnated and to be recognized. The old people would look at a newborn baby and tell you who it was, <laughs> who it was. And as the child was growing up, they'd see how it walked and listen to how it talked and they could tell you who it was in its, one of his past lives. So it was just part of living. It was nothing unusual or strange. The Aborigines believe that the supernatural power of the dream time spirits are contained within sacred objects. They are used in the most holy ceremonies of the Aborigines and inscribed with sacred designs similar to these. Aboriginal rules prohibit the actual designs to be shown to outsiders or even to Aborigines who have not been prepared with the proper initiations.
In Central Australia, for example, the most sacred object is called a churinga, and these are often engraved slabs of rock, or they can be engraved slabs of wood as well. They are apparently some of the most spectacular art forms that are made. Another key aspect of Aboriginal societies involves power, power in the landscape, power from the past, power in objects. This is spiritual power, it's the creative and destructive power of nature. If someone were to show a powerful object, a powerful image, to an uninitiated person who hadn't learnt how to handle it, then some terrible harm would come to them. The Aborigines regard the magic contained in objects like these to be so powerful that there are prohibitions against even speaking of them. In the past, transgressors were sometimes punished with death. If there's a group of people and there's a public kind and someone started to go into secret matters or sacred matters, one of the elders would give them the strong eye, which is just, boom, that hard look. And that person would know exactly to cut. Don't say any more, you're going on dangerous grounds. When Europeans first invaded Australia at the end of the 18th century, many sacred ritual objects of profound significance were stolen as curiosities or souvenirs. Eventually, some of these items were displayed in museums where they were treated with the dignity due to treasured artifacts of Aboriginal culture. But even this was a grave infraction of Aboriginal law. Today, many Australian museums have constructed special rooms to house these precious relics. Rooms open only to Aborigines. And because of that, I cannot even describe what they look like. All I can say is that some are made of stone, some are made of wood. But if I were to describe any of the designs, then I would be in a lot of trouble. We keep these things separate in accordance with Aboriginal custom and when Aboriginal people wish to see that we have to identify that they are the appropriate custodians and then they have access to seeing this material. I mean I can't personally say because of course I'm not allowed to go with them but I have heard that people can get very emotional that they will sing the songs associated with some of those objects um, so you know obviously for them they're still incredibly important. The most powerful of these ritual objects may be used for good or for evil. Strict laws of secrecy guard the most sacred rights of the Aborigines. If these laws are broken, or if other rules of the tribe are violated, the transgressor may be punished by a terrifying figure. The sorcerer, the Kadaji man. This is a man who um, sometimes is described as being evil and wears special shoes made out of emu feathers to cover his tracks. Usually this man has the, the job of ritually punishing, often through death, an individual who has seriously broken a key law, for instance, defiling a, a sacred site. On his missions of retribution, the Kadaja man travels silently. Some believe he possesses the magic to make himself invisible. There is a widespread belief that the Kadaji men possess the power to kill merely by the use of magical incantations. Over the years, anthropologists have reported that unexplained deaths of this kind do in fact happen. But how can killings such as these be accomplished? 
these people have the power to harm you if you've done something that they don't like, they want some form of revenge. There's been lots of stories, I'm sure a lot of people have heard, of people who've actually died for no medical reason because they believe that they've actually been sung or had some sorcery done to them. Sometimes there was actual physical contact um, and the person might be harmed or, or killed through physical action. But quite often it was through the power of suggestion. According to Aboriginal belief, some sorcerers may work their black magic out of sheer malice. When they become very ill, the Aborigines believe a chant or ritual curse may have been placed on them. Often people feel their sickness is related to somebody sorcerizing them. They don't look at it in terms of germ theory or you know, viral infection. And they feel often that they're sick because somebody has sung them or something has been done to them. And they have to find someone who can heal them and then they will get better. When they believe a curse has been cast upon them, the Aborigines turn to healers called the clever men or men of high degree. This doctoring is from the olden times. This has been going on for generations and generations. It's been passed down from the special people, our traditional healers. I learned this from my grandfather and he learned it from his. I'm older now, and a lot of people seek me out to help them. Satya Sankalpa Saraswati is a doctor who has worked closely with Aboriginal healers at the Pichajanjera Homelands Health Service in Southwest Australia. She has breast cancer and has come to Jimmy Baker for her own healing. Traditional healers have always been an integral part of Aboriginal culture. But why would someone schooled in Western medicine come to them for help? Cancer is a very serious thing, and I'm the mother of three children, so I do take it very seriously. Um, and I'm doing reasonably well with what I'm doing, but I'm very open to whatever healings are around me. I'm not limiting myself to one thing. When I am doctoring people, I use my hands. I can feel not only the top layer of skin, but inside, deep inside. And that is how I'm able to get the illness out. And all the time when he was doing it, feeling very deeply and talking to me, what I felt was not just the pain, but also just his very loving presence. And he was also quietly saying really loving things to me, you know, like, you are a really lovely person and, you know, all this very thing from the heart. Often using methods such as these, the clever men do seem to achieve success. From experience, they know which illnesses can be cured and when their healing is likely to be successful. Thank you. Within their society, they continue a tradition which stretches back tens of thousands of years. Because of this, their skills and knowledge are held in high esteem by the Aborigines. The traditional healers represent the old ways, the old generation. When they die, who will take their place? For tens of thousands of years, the Aborigines have lived in harmony with their environment. Yet the last 200 years have brought dramatic and violent changes to their world. For perhaps 2,000 generations, 
The Aborigines lived in a world unto themselves. Then in 1788, the British arrived. They began to claim the ancestral Aboriginal lands for farms, mines, and cities. The Aborigines fought back, but boomerangs and spears were no match for bullets. Those not killed in war faced death from the diseases carried by the British. The Aborigines were forced to live on government reservations, in conditions so poor and with an infant mortality rate so high that by the turn of the 20th century, it seemed the Aborigines were doomed to extinction. Yet they have endured, sustained by the power of the dream time. We are always here, we always will be, and, and that is in reference to the spirit choosing the body it needs. This is what I've been told over and over again, uh, and uh, you know, being told by spirits who have passed on and come back to give those messages through other elders who could listen. It was not until 1976, almost 200 years after the English arrival, that the government of Australia began returning to the Aborigines some of the ancestral land that had been taken from them. There's been a resurgent in ritual life over the past 15 years or so, and that also relates back to the fact we've had land rights. People have actually left the major mission settlements and government reserves gone back to set up small family art stations on what is now their own land. In order to reclaim their lost territories, the Aborigines must prove their tribe once lived there. They must be able to recite the stories and the traditions associated with it. The art songs and stories from the land is very important part to retain, firstly to re establish relationship. You have to know about it to have that close relationship. It is required in land rights claim here in this country. We have to know our story, our song and dance for the specific uh, country we say is ours. Today, many Aborigines live in two worlds. The dream time survives in both. It's a bit of a mix. I mean, you'll find people have the trappings often of Western society. They live in houses, drive cars, use faxes and phones. But on the other hand, they're still very Aboriginal. They perform ceremonies. They're still very much in touch. Many people look to Aboriginal people for answers to problems that we all face. Because of the tremendous pace of change in Western society and indeed the world in general, we're quickly running out of time to solve problems of pollution, uh, better managing the land, crime, relationships to each other, warfare and so forth. And it's believed that perhaps because of their strong relationships to the land that goes back many tens of thousands of years, that perhaps we can learn something that will benefit all of us. Ironically, the culture they once tried to destroy is now seen in a completely different light by most white Australians. Today, museums present appropriate Aboriginal exhibits. And in Sydney, upscale restaurants now offer traditional Aboriginal cuisine. Australia's burgeoning tourist industry uses the Aborigines as an attraction. This has also had a major impact on Aboriginal life. 
tourism has been actually of great benefit to a lot of people. The art and craft industry, for example, has become an incredibly important industry for Aboriginal people and it's also become one of our major visual arts exports. It's worth millions of dollars, you know, to the Australian economy. Although the Aborigines welcome the benefits of tourism, tourists will never learn the deepest secrets of the dream time. These are given only to the Aborigines' most precious resource, their children. We're drumming all this story into them about the dream time, the history, the industry, the creation songs, the song lines and all this. And they are picking it up again, eh? they're coming back. But because we're still around, we are the original, the, the elders of the country, you see, and we pass it on to the younger children. For the Aborigines, the dream time is the past, the present, and perhaps most importantly, the future. The dream time did not end with the creation of the world. It continues today through the memories of every Aboriginal elder and with the birth of every Aboriginal child. To the Aborigines, the dream time is something that is universal, something that will never end. The dreaming of Chukupa, we're all part of it. But now, if, if we believe it or not in our small national or society, it doesn't make any difference. It's bigger than that. It's so big that even the concept to, to say it doesn't exist isn't in it. it is, it's irrelevant because your spirit is part of it. No matter what you say, it is part of it. This is what I've been told over and over again, being told by spirits who have passed on and come back to give those messages through other elders who could listen. The Aborigines did not build cities. They did not found empires. They've always tried to live at one with the land that has sustained them. And they've been successful for at least 60,000 years. Could it be that this is the way we were all meant to live? Perhaps, when the modern, civilized world has run its perilous course, the first Australians will still remain. <laughs>